The petrol sprinklers, hitherto used to destroy pests and blights on the plantation, were also brought into action. Streams of evil reeking oil now soared and fell over an enemy already in disorder through the bombardment of earth and sand. The ants responded to these vigorous and, un and successful measures of defense by further developments of their offensive. Entire clumps of huddling insects began to roll down the opposite bank into the water. At the same time, Leiningen noticed that the ants were now attacking along an ever-widening front. As the numbers of both his men and petrol sprinklers were severely limited, this rapid extension of the line of battle was becoming an overwhelming danger. To add to his difficulties, the very clods of earth they flung into the black floating carpet off the world fragments toward the defender's side, and here and there dark ribbons were already mounting the inner bank. True, wherever a man saw these, they could be, still be driven back into the water by spades full of earth or jets of petrol. But the file of defenders was too sparse and scattered to hold off at all points these landing parties, and though the peons toiled like madmen, their plight became momentarily more perilous. One man struck with his spade at an enemy clump, did not draw it back quickly enough from the water. In a trice, the wooden shaft swarmed with upward scurrying insects. With a curse, he dropped the spade into the ditch. Too late. They were already on his body. They lost no time. Wherever they encountered bare flesh, they bit deeply. A few, bigger than the rest, carried in their hind quarters a sting which injected a burning and paralyzing venom. Screaming, frantic with pain, the peon danced and twirled like a dervish. Realizing that another such casualty, yes, perhaps this alone, might plunge the men into confusion and destroy their morale, Leiningen roared in a bellow louder than the yells of the victim. Into the petrol, you idiot! Douse your paws in the petrol! The dervish ceased his pirouette as if transfixed, then tore off his shirt and plunged his arm and the ants hanging to it up to one shoulder in one of the large open tins of petrol. But even then the fierce mandibles did not slacken. Another peon had to help him squash and detach each separate insect. Distracted by the episode, some defenders had turned away from the ditch, and now cries of fury, a thudding of spades, and a wild trampling to and fro showed that the ants had made full use of the interval, though luckily only a few had managed to get across. The men set to work again desperately with a barrage of earth and sand. Meanwhile, an old Indian who acted as medicine man to the plantation workers gave the bitten peon a drink he had prepared some hours before, which he claimed possessed the virtue of dissolving the, and weakening ants' venom. Leinigen surveyed his position. A dispassionate observer would have estimated the odds against him at a thousand to one. But then such an onlooker would have reckoned only by what he saw, the advance of myriad battalions of ants against the futile efforts of a few defenders, and not by the unseen activity that can go on in a man's brain. For Leinigen had not erred when he decided he would fight elemental with elemental. The water in the ditch was beginning to rise. The stronger damming of the river was making itself apparent. Visibly, the swift and power of the masses of water increased, swirling into quicker and quicker movement, its living black surface dispersing its pattern, carrying away more and more of it on the hastening current. Victory had been snatched from the very jaws of defeat. With a hysterical shout of joy, the peons feverishly intensified their bombardment of earth, clods, and sand. And now the wide cataract down the opposite bank was thinning and ceasing, as if the ants were becoming aware that they could not attain their aim. They were scurrying back up the slope to safety. All the troops so far hurled into the ditch had been sacrificed in vain, drowned in floundering insects eddied in thousands along the flow, while Indians running on the bank destroyed every swimmer that reached the side. Not until the ditch curved upwards the east did the scattered ranks assemble again in a coherent mass, and now, exhausted and half-numbed, they were in no condition to ascend the banks. Fusillades of clods drove them round the bend towards the mouth of the ditch and then into the river, 
wherein they vanished without leaving a trace. The news ran swiftly along the entire chain of outposts, and soon a long scattered line of laughing men could be seen hastening along the ditch towards the scene of victory. For once they seemed to have lost all their native reserve, for it was in wild abandon now they celebrated the triumph, as if there were no longer thousands of millions of merciless, cold, and hungry eyes watching them from the opposite bank, watching and waiting. The sun sank behind the rim of the tamarind wood. Twilight deepened into the night. It was not only hoped but expected that the ants would remain quiet until dawn. But to defeat any forlorn attempt at a crossing, the flow of water through the ditch was powerfully increased by opening the dam still further. In spite of this impregnable barrier, Leiningen was not yet altogether convinced that the ants would not venture another surprise attack. He ordered his men to camp along the bank overnight. He also detailed parties of them to patrol the ditch in two of his motor cars and ceaselessly to illuminate the surface of the water with headlights and electric torches. After having taken all the precautions he deemed necessary, the farmer ate his supper with considerable appetite and went to bed. His slumbers were in no wise disturbed by the memory of the waiting, live, twenty square miles. Don found a thoroughly refreshed and active line engine riding along the edge of the ditch. The planter saw before him a motionless and unaltered throng of besiegers. He studied the wide belt of water between them and the plantation and for a moment almost regretted that the fight had ended so soon and so simply. In the comforting, matter-of-fact light of morning, it seemed to him now that the ants hadn't the ghost of a chance to cross the ditch. Even if they plunged headlong into it on all three fronts at once, the force of the, of the now powerful current would inevitably sweep them away. He had, got a, he had got quite a thrill out of the fight. A pity it was already over. He rode along the eastern and southern sections of the ditch and found everything in order. He reached the western section, opposite the Tamarind Wood, and here, contrary to the other battlefronts, he found the enemy very busy indeed. The trunks and branches of the trees and the creepers of the lianas on the far bank of the ditch fairly swarmed with industrious insects, but instead of eating the leaves there and then, they were merely gnawing through the stalks so that the green so that a thick green shower fell steadily to the ground. No doubt they were victualling columns sent out to obtain provender for the rest of the army. The discovery did not surprise Leningen. He did not need to be told that ants are intelligent, that certain species even use others as milch cows, watchdogs, and slaves. He was well aware of their power of adaptation, their sense of discipline, their marvelous talent for organization. His belief that a foray to supply the army was in progress was strengthened when he saw the leaves that fell to the ground being dragged to the troops waiting outside the wood. Then all at once he realized the aim that rain of green was intended to serve. Each single leaf, pulled or pushed by dozens of toiling in insects, was borne straight to the edge of the ditch. Even as Macbeth watched the approach of Burnham Wood in his hands, of his enemies, Leiningen saw the tamarind wood move nearer and nearer in the mandibles of the ants. Unlike the Fay Scott, however, he did not lose his nerve. No witches had prophesied his doom, and if they had, he would have slept just as soundly. All the same, he was forced to admit to himself that the situation was far more ominous than that of the day before. He had thought it impossible for the ants to build rafts for themselves. Well, here they were coming in thousands, more than enough to bridge the ditch. Leaves after leaves rustled down the slope into the water, where the current drew them away from the bank and carried them into midstream, and every single leaf carried several ants. This time the farmer did not trust to the alacrity of his messengers. He galloped away, leaning from his saddle and yelling orders as he rushed past outpost after outpost. Bring petrol pumps to the southwest front, Issue spades to every man along the line facing the wood. And arrived at the eastern and southern sections, he dispatched every man except the observation post to the menaced west. Then as he rode past the stretch where the ants had failed to cross the day before, he witnessed a brief but impressive scene. 
Down the slope of the distant hill there came towards him a singular being, writhing rather man man running, an animal-like blackened statue with shapeless head and four quivering feet that knuckled under almost ceaselessly. When the creature reached the far bank of the ditch and collapsed opposite Leiningen, he recognized it as a pampas stag, covered over and over with ants. It had strayed near the zone of the army. As usual, they had attacked its eyes first. Blinded, it had reeled in the madness of hideous torment straight into the ranks of its persecutors, and now the beast swayed to and fro in its death agony. With a shot from his rifle, Linogen put it out of its misery. Then he pulled out his watch. He hadn't a second to lose, but for life itself he could not have denied his curiosity the satisfaction of knowing how long the ants would take, for, sev for personal reasons, so to speak. After six minutes, the white polished bones alone remained. That's how him, he himself would look before you can, Linogen spat once, and put, his, put spurs to his horse. The sporting zest with, with which the excitement of the novel contest had inspired him the day before had now vanished. In its place was a cold and violent purpose. He would send these vermin back to hell where they belonged, somehow, anyhow. Yes, but how was indeed the question. As things stood at present, it looked as if the devils would raise him and his men from the earth instead. He had underestimated the might of the enemy. He really would have to bestir himself if he hoped to outwit them. The biggest danger now, he decided, was the point where the western section of the ditch curved southwards. And arrived there, he found his worst expectations justified. The very power of the current had huddled the leaves and their crews of ants so close together at the bend that the bridge was almost ready. True, streams of petrol and clumps of earth still prevented a landing, but the number of floating leaves was increasing ever more swiftly. It could not be long now before a stretch of, a wa of water a mile in length was decked by a green pontoon over which the ants could rush in millions. Linogen galloped to the weir. The damming of the river was controlled by a wheel on its bank. The planter ordered the, men, the man at the wheel first to lower the water in the ditch almost to a vanishing point, next to wait a moment, then suddenly to let the river in again. This maneuver of lowering and raising the surface, of decreasing then increasing the flow of water through the ditch, was to be repeated over and over again until, the, until further notice. This tactic was at first successful. The water in the ditch sank, and with it the film of leaves. The green fleet nearly reached the bed, and the troops on the far bank swarmed down the slope to it. Then a violent flow of water at the original depth raced through the ditch, overwhelming leaves and ants, and sweeping them along. This intermittent rapid flushing prevented just in time the almost completed fording of the ditch, but it also flung here and there squads of the enemy vanguard simul simultaneously up the inner bank. These seemed to know their duty only too well, and lost no time accomplishing it. They are rang with the curses of bitten Indians. They had removed their shirts and pants to detect the quicker the quicker the upwards hastening insects. When they saw one, they crushed it, and fortunately the, on, the onslaught as yet was only by skirmishers. Again and again the water sank and rose, carrying leaves and drowned ants away with it. It lowered once more, once more nearly to its bed, but this time the exhausted defenders waited in vain for the flush of destruction. Linogen sensed disaster. Something must have gone wrong with the machinery of the dam. Then a sweating peon tore up to him. They're over! While the besieged were concentrating upon the defense of the stretch opposite the wood, the seemingly unaffected line beyond the wood had become the theater of decisive action. Here the defender's front was sparse and scattered. Everyone who could be spared had hurried away to the south. Just as the man at the weir had lowered the water almost to the bed of the ditch, the ants on a wide front began another attempt at a direct crossing, like that of the preceding day. Into the emptied bed poured an irresistible throng. Rushing across the ditch, they attained the inner bank before the slow-witted Indians fully grasped the situation. Their frantic screams dumbfounded the man at the weir. Before he could direct the river 
anew into the safeguarding bed, he saw himself surrounded by raging ants. He ran like the others, ran for his life. When Linogen heard this, he knew the plantation was doomed. He wasted no time bemoaning the inevitable. For as long as there was the slightest chance of success, he had stood his ground. Now any further resistance was both useless and dangerous. He fired three revolver shots into the air, the prearranged signal for his men to retreat instantly within the inner moat. Then he rode towards the ranch house. This was two miles from the point of invasion. There was, therefore, time enough to prepare the second line of defense against the advent of the ants. Of the three great petrol cisterns near the house, one had already been half emptied by the constant withdrawals needed for the pumps during the fight at the water ditch. The remaining petrol in it was now drawn off through underground pipes into the concrete trench which encircled the ranch house and its outbuildings. And there, drifting in twos and threes, Leinengen's men reached him. Most of them were obviously trying to preserve an air of calm and indifference, belied, however, by their restless glance and knitted brows. One could see their belief in a favorable outcome of the struggle was already considerably shaken. The planter called his peons around him. Well, lads, he began, we've lost the first round, but we'll smash the beggars yet. Don't you worry. Anyone who thinks otherwise can draw his pay here and now and push off. There are rafts enough to spare on the river and plenty of time still to reach him. Not a man stirred. Linogen acknowledged his silent vote of confidence with a laugh that was half a grunt. That's the stuff, lads. Too bad if you'd miss the rest of the show, eh? Well, the fun won't start till morning. Once these blighters turn tail, there will be plenty of work for everyone and higher wages all around. And now run along and get something to eat. You've earned it, all right. In the excitement of the fight, the greater part of the day had passed without the men once pausing to snatch a bite. Now that the ants were, for the time being, out of sight and the wall of petrol gave a stronger feeling of security, hungry stomachs began to assert their claims. The bridges over the concrete ditch were, were removed. Here and there, solitary ants had reached the ditch. They gazed at the petrol meditatively, then scurried back again. Apparently, they had little interest at the moment for what lay beyond the evil reeking barrier. The abundant spoils of the plantation were the main attraction. Soon the trees, shrubs, and beds for miles around were hulled with ants zealously gobbling the yield of long, weary months of strenuous toil. As twilight began to fall, a cordon of ants marched around the petrol trench, but as yet made no move towards its brink. Linogen posted sentries with headlights and electric torches, then withdrew to his office and began to reckon up his losses. He estimated these as large, but in comparison with his bank balance, by no means unbearable. He worked out in some detail a scheme of intensive cultivation which would enable him, before very long, to more than compensate himself for the damage now being wrought to his crops. It was with a contented mind that he finally betook himself to bed where he slept deeply until dawn, undisturbed by any thought that next day little more might be left of him than a glistening skeleton. He rose with the sun and went out on the flat roof of his house, and a scene like one from Dante lay around him. For miles in every direction there was nothing but a black, glittering multitude, a multitude of rested, sated, but nonetheless voracious ants. Yes, look as far as one might, one could see nothing but that rustling black throng, except in the north, where the great river drew a boundary they could not hope to pass. But even the high stone breakwater along the bank of the river, which Linogen had built as a defense against inundations, was like the pass, the shorn trees and shrubs, the ground itself black with ants. So their greed was not glutted in raising that vast plantation, not by a long shot. They were all the more eager now on a rich and certain booty. Four hundred men, numerous horses, and bursting granaries. At first it seemed that the petrol trench would serve its purpose. 
the besiegers sensed that the peril of swimming it, and made no move to plunge blindly over its brink. Instead, they devised a better maneuver, began to collect shreds of bark, twigs, and dried leaves, and dropped these into the petrol. Everything green which could have been similarly used had long since been eaten. After a time, though, a long procession could be seen bringing from the west the tamarind leaves used as rafts the day before. Since the petrol, unlike the water in the outer ditch, was perfectly still, the refuse stayed where it was thrown. It was several hours before the ants succeeded in covering an appreciable part of the surface. At length, however, they were ready to proceed to a direct attack. Their storm troops swarmed down the concrete sides, scrambled over the supporting surface of twigs and leaves, and impelled these over the few remaining streaks of open petrol until they reached the other side. Then they began to climb up this to make straight for the helpless garrison. During the entire offensive, the planter sat peacefully, watching them with interest, but not stirring a muscle. Moreover, he had ordered his men not to disturb in any way whatever the advancing horde. Soon they squatted listlessly along the bank of the ditch and waited for a sign from the boss. The petrol was now covered with ants. A few had climbed the inner concrete wall and were scurrying towards the defenders. Everyone back from the ditch, roared Leiningen. The men rushed away without the slightest idea of his plan. He stooped forward and cautiously dropped into the ditch a stone which split the floating carpet and its living freight to reveal a gleaming patch of petrol. A match spurted, sank down to the oily surface. Linogen sprang back. In a flash, a towering rampart of fire encompassed the garrison. This spectacular intense repulse threw the Indians into ecstasy. They applauded, yelled and stamped, like children at a pantomime. Had it not been for the awe in which they held the boss, they would infallibly have carried him shoulder high. It was some time before the petrol burned down to the bed of the ditch and the wall of smoke and flame began to lower. The ants had retreated in a wide circle from the devastation and innumerable shard fragments along the outer bank showed that the flames had spread from the holocaust in the ditch well into the ranks beyond, where they had wrought havoc far and wide. Yet the perseverance of the ants was by no means broken. Indeed, each setback seemed only to wet it. The concrete cooled, the flicker of the dying flames wavered and vanished, petrol from the second tank poured into the trench, and the ants marched forward anew to the attack. The foregoing scene repeated itself in every detail except that on this occasion less time was needed to bridge the ditch, for the petrol was now already filmed by a layer of ash. Once again they withdrew, once again petrol flowed into the, into the ditch. Would the creatures never learn that their self-sacrifice was utterly senseless? It really was senseless, wasn't it? Yes, of course it was senseless, provided the defenders had an unlimited supply of petrol.